XCR 60. Um, wait, it's 10 o'clock, right? Uh, he's not here. Um, you know, he wanted to testify on this, and I, I, want to. I thought I signed in on it, but I. Uh, yes, you did. Yeah. Okay, you're welcome to. to I'll go look for <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. For the record, I'm Representative Randy Cushing from Rockingham 21. I'm here in support of CACR 16. I'm a co-sponsor along with Representative Kirk. I think to me, the um, essence of liberty is the right to be left alone. And what this piece of this amendment to the Constitution will enshrine um, and clarify that, that liberty includes the right to privacy. Um, it's pretty simple, it's, it, it, it's straightforward. I think in, in New Hampshire, we've always had a pretty strong part of our, our, our cultural and, and political tradition is that right to be just to be left alone, to be free from um, you know, government intrusion into our, our, our personal lives. This kind of codifies it, and I would, uh, I would urge the committee to support this and pass it on to the Senate floor, pass the House by a substantial margin. Sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. You can finish. Um, my first question, are you going to mute with your testimony? Certainly. My first question was, I thought this was already uh, assumed that we had the right to be left alone, but I, I, I take it there's a need to this. You, I believe, I believe, I believe there is. I think as we are increasingly, um, as our technology, as our society evolves over time, what I, I, I believe was always, again, because I think that privacy is the essence the right to be left alone, is, which is privacy, it's the essence of liberty, which we're guaranteed. But I think this makes it even more explicit that we're that we that an individual has the right to be free from government intrusion on our private or personal information. Any questions from the committee? Thank you for stepping up to the plate. Oh, really appreciate it. Um, Representative Timothy Hardy, you still here? Yes. Uh, the first one to speak on this, and then uh, in opposition, I'd love to hear from you. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Representative Kirk, apparently House Finance is exacting the bill right now, but he'll be here as soon as we can. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, again, I'm not totally opposed to amendment similar to this in principle, but I, I mean, I agree with the sponsors that privacy is a fundamental right, and I love the chapter heading for the proposed article. Uh, 2B, which is, quote, um, right, square bracket, right to privacy, square bracket, unquote. Um, unfortunately, that's just a chapter heading, so I can't support a constitutional amendment just because I like the chapter heading. And um, when it went to the House, about 90, almost 100 members uh, agreed with that. In fact, it's only here because the speaker had to cast a vote to send it over here. Um, I think the prose language, of this, in my opinion, uses a weak and incomplete definition of privacy and also couples with a random set of three very nice um, adjectives, natural, essential, and inherent. So it sounds like something out of a corporate mission statement or like something out of a political platform. So I'm, I'm worried about how this language will be interpreted by our state's lawyers and judges. I think CACR is language that have many unintended consequences if we actually put it in the Constitution and start having some privacy-related cases, although I'm certainly uh, privacy is a very important right. Um, uh, on the other hand, in one respect, ironically, the language is too specific. It speaks only of governmental intrusion or private and personal information. So that ex excludes non-governmental intrusion, such as, to name just one random example, the 400 megabyte dossier about every aspect of my own personal life, which I downloaded a few days ago from Facebook. Although I'm still using Facebook, so I haven't like, gotten off it just because of that. Anyways, this bill, I would say it's literally, it's not ready for prime time. It's special we use a lot around here, not ready for prime time. So I think 400 pages of dossier on you? Well, 400 megabytes. It's mostly just a list of every uh, call I made in my cell phone call since 2000, between, I think, 2015 and 2017. Maybe you could write a book and sell it. <laughs> yes, well, I could try that. I have maybe better luck with the other ones I've written and tried to sell it. But um, anyway, the uh, proposed language, I don't think it's ready for the 2018 general election ballot, and I certainly don't think it's ready as it is to go into state constitution. Um, I mean, if you want 
if you want to take a stab at uh, amending it, although there isn't much time to do so, I might might feel differently when it comes back to the House for the Committee of Conference, but I think uh, I just I just don't, I think the basic concept is good, but I think what we produced, even though we worked hard in, on it in the committee, just isn't something, you know, just isn't something that's ready to send to the voters, in my opinion, so. Thank you very much, Thank Representative Mugoshi, for the testimony. Is there a question, Senator Bain? Yeah. The testimony you mentioned that the uh, passage of this would likely have many unintended consequences. Can you give us some examples? Um, well, just, uh, Lots of lots of legal cases involve uh, you know, the use of private information. I'm sure Representative Kirk will have some interesting examples. And uh, I just think uh, when we get the defense lawyers and the prosecutors and the judges involved, and we put something that sort of sounds like it means something, but I certainly don't understand what it means. So I'm just hesitant about how that's going to affect uh, you know the operation of law enforcement and uh, you know there's some like since there is uh, the government sometimes does have to use it our personal information for all sorts of purposes, so what's intrusion and what's proper use, and what's, and then I don't know what those three adjectives really mean, examples. Like, it started out, I think, was just saying it was a natural right, and then there, there's some concern about it, so we added two more adjectives to the list. So, yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator I think a question maybe of um, Mr. Cushing yes. or yeah. any, any of the reps. Yeah. Uh, I'm just looking at the bill docket, yeah. and it was certainly my understanding, I believe, in the Senate that when we take action on a constitutional amendment, it cannot be by a division vote. It has to be by a reported roll call. And you didn't do that. Um, Same question. Respectfully, I believe a division is a recorded vote. It's not necessary to have it be a roll call. Hmm. That's correct. Granted, the practice, and I know that for the most time, it's usually a roll call vote. No one asked for a roll call vote. The division was taken the best. But it's, it was sufficient to meet the threshold two thirds of the meeting. Yeah. To, well, to I meet see meeting. that, but uh, that's a challenge. No. Correct. Because what you're doing is you're looking for the numerical. Correct. Yeah. Really? Okay. Not the, not the, uh, the and, and 235 is the threshold right now? Yes, I believe my clerk is left, but I, that's my recollection. That that's what there. And the reason, reason I commented on the speaker vote is because Can you just have that come up here? Huh? Yeah, oh, you can. Okay. We're, we're not going to be able to pick up any I believe the speaker did yeah. ask to vote on that to make it yes. sufficient to yes. pass the record. I think he said so on the floor of the house. And right. Yeah. And it, was, mm -hmm. it was pretty clear. It was for the record. It's in the house record. And that's from Representative Cushing and Representative yeah. and, and just both yeah. sides. Both sides of the we will, on both sides, we will agree that there were sufficient votes to make the constitutional requirement in order to pass it on to the Senate for your action. Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Vincent, do you want to comment on this bill? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Representative Dan It's a Rock Camp County District 10, the town of Fremont. Um, what this does is state what has always been understood as a matter of common law, which is that your 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 right to privacy in regards to the government is extensive and complete. The only thing that the Constitution does is, I believe, in because I don't have. Believe it or not, don't have my copy with me. I believe it's Article 15 or 17 states the narrow circumstances in which that privacy may be broached, which is by warrant with an oath or affidavit. Without that oath or affidavit, the, the government does not have legitimate power to broach your privacy. That being the case, if I can see where I can that being the case, why do you need this? Does this affect that broach, uh, that ability to broach no. that? No, it does not affect that, that ability to broach because the ability to broach is, in fact, constitutional. Uh, the I think the overriding issue is that when the Constitution was written, you, all of your information was, was physical. Uh, and today, uh, a lot of uh, our information, the vast majority of our information, is electronic. And, and 
it is much easier to broach surreptitiously. And therefore, it is important to remind the government that, in fact, they don't have the power to broach that without an open and sworn warrant. They didn't have computers back No, they didn't. Thank they you. didn't even have ballpoint pens. Uh, questions from the committee? Senator uh, Thank you, Representative Itzi. I'm sure you recall in 1973, Roe v. Wade was defined based on um, the right of privacy under the federal constitution. How does this impact that? Um, I don't think I don't think it impacts it adversely. If that's that's the question, um, I, I think it's important when looking at Roe v. Wade that that uh, what the the federal case really did um, I want to say functionally was say that there was a certain class of murder for which uh, the state could not obtain a warrant even if there was. Uh, Otherwise, justification for it, the, the, the federal government said you can't even look at it, remembering that all those laws regarding abortion were state laws. And the federal government said, no, in this case, you, even though somebody's broken this state law, you don't have the power to broach that private and personal information. Aren't you, by virtue of asking the question, putting this amendment into the New Hampshire Constitution? And this is why I'm asking you because I don't think you're a supporter of Roe v. Wade. I understand. Um, aren't you enshrining the precepts of Roe v. Wade in the New Hampshire Constitution? No, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. No, I don't think so. No, I don't is think so. Answer? Seriously, I, I, I seriously don't. Uh, remember that first of all, it was that was determined vis-a-vis -vis the federal constitution, rightly or wrongly. If Roe v. Wade were to disappear today, and this amendment were to be adopted, that would not change whether or not the state had the power to, and the state would then to reinstitute its laws then existing regarding abortion. And the law regarding abortion then was that anybody who killed a quick child was guilty of, was, was uh, uh, liable for a fine of $10,000, because it really pertained to positions. There would be nothing between this right of privacy and the right to obtain a warrant, or the power to obtain a warrant, I should say, that would say, if the state had reason to believe that a physician had committed such an act, that the state couldn't get a warrant to do it, to, to make the investigation. No, I don't, I don't think it changes that. That's a matter of whether or not we make a law and whether a warrant can be sworn. Oh. Any further questions? Representatives, thank you very much. Honorable McGuire, how are you, sir? Very good, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, and thank, thank you, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dan McGuire. I'm here representing the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, and we're very much in support of this um, constitutional amendment. Um, most of what I have to say is to echo what uh, Representative Itzi said. Um, when, when the uh, Fourth Amendment was put in and, and Section 19 of our uh, Part 1 of our Constitution was put in, which reads very similarly, um, every subject has the right to be secure from all unreasonable searches and seizures of his person, his houses, his papers, and his possessions, etc. And it talks about warrants. Um, when those things were put in, private, private stuff um, or physical private stuff was, was located somewhere, right? It was papers, it was um, notes, things like that. And, and they would be located in your house, possibly your business, maybe in the mail, things like that. But they would all be visible to the eye and, and physical. Um, today, the, the, 
what this, what this constitutional amendment is doing is updating that kind of a provision, but for the modern world, where there's lots of information about people that, while it's physical, it's no longer, it, it's, it's infinitesimal, right? It's, it's, it's not visible, right? So, for example, my emails, right, are somewhere in Google, who knows where, <laughs> right? They're, they're, they could be in the other countries, they could be, you know, and, and you know, they're physically somewhere, but they're, they're, they're tiny, and, and, and the, the idea of searching a place and, and looking for something is really not, it's not applicable, uh, is not comprehensive enough um, to cover those, that private sort of information. Also things like your DNA, right? Um, that's, that's something that, um, I, I don't know if uh, Representative Cushing mentioned this, but, but I know Representative Kirk would, would make the point that um, if you go to Starbucks and you drink a cup of coffee and you throw away the cup, your DNA is in that cup. <laughs> And, and if the police is following you and they want your DNA, they could pick up the cup and say, well, you, don't, you abandon it. <laughs> you know, so no search warrant is needed, right? So that's the kind of information that this bill is talking about. It's about um, things that, are, that exist, but they're tiny and they're, they're, they, they need to be stated as information rather than things. Um, I'd like to also address um, Representative, uh, sorry, Senator Bradley brought up the issue of abortion and Roe versus Wade and so on. And I, I heard this argument recently, um, and I think it is something possibly to be concerned about. Um, the best way, I, I, I don't, I agree with Representative Itzi that this doesn't apply because it's about information, <coughs> but, but the best way to sort of inoculate against that would be if you decide to pass this, to make a speech on the Senate floor um, stating that this is not about uh, abortion, this is not about Roe versus Wade, and ask that to be put into the permanent journal. Um, and that way, if it ever became a court case later on, there would be legislative precedent to say, look, this is not about those kind of issues. That's the, that's the right way to, to handle those kind of, kind of things, where you think, Maybe somewhere, you know, because of course, <laughs> you know, courts that have done things, odd things, you never can tell, right? I mean, <laughs> I'll just say this. It's one of those instances, be prepared for what you ask for. I understand. You might get it because I, I, um, you know, when I read this language and I say information, well, you may think information is digital information, but one's personal medical history or condition is also information. And I think you're enshrining that right into the Constitution. Yes, thank so, you. Enshrining that right of privacy on your personal medical information in the Constitution. And I suspect, like Representative Itzi, you're not a supporter of Roe v. Wade. So that's what I mean about being prepared for what you asked for because I'm not, who knows what will happen in the future. Yeah, thank you for that. But again, I would say, suggest, I would suggest that get it into the legislative record that we don't think it's about that. And then that, that would certainly help at least in the long run. Thank you. I do have a question with regards to, um, this basically is limiting the government from, from uh, going into your personal, whatever's in the cloud, if you will. Yeah. So, <clears throat> whether it's Ancestry.com or you surrender your DNA, uh, and it's a private corporation that now owns that information, or Google that has a dossier on it, uh, which nobody permitted them not to have, uh, at, you know, who knows what's going on. Right. There. Uh, undoubtedly, in the, in the fine print of the 15-page thing that you agree to when you click on it, it said that they could do whatever they want with your information, right? So, uh, so that being said, and, and the whole host of all the other social media's out there, would this then prevent the uh, government from seeking out that information to those entities rather than directly into your own files? 
Meaning, you got your computer, you've got all your information. Yes, they can't go into all that, but somebody else has it. Can they solicit that from those private uh, corporations? Does this prevent them from doing so? Um, Without a warrant? Yes, I, I think the answer is generally yes. All right, because it's again, it's about it's about the individual's information, but not it doesn't regard to where it is, right? It could be in the custody of Google, it could be in the custody of whatever. So, so that being said, uh, the courts could say, or the government could say, well, we can't do that, but that's not to stop the corporations from saying, hey, we got this, you want it? I see. Um, Would it prevent them from, from at least uh, accepting without a warrant if, if somebody else owned the information? Could they then say, hey, you own this as well, this information, Ancestry.com. We have your DNA because you surrendered it and you decided to release forms. And we're just going to put a general plea out there. We would love this information. If anybody has any information, sure. would you please surrender it? Does this stop them from surrendering that information? Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point where maybe it's, this is the beyond my pay grade type of question <laughs> because I'm an engineer. I'm not an attorney. Okay. But certainly there are cases where. Um, government has improperly obtained information, they later bring a, a case against somebody, and that information is thrown out and not considered by the court in their trial because it was improperly obtained, right? So the, the examples, I think what you're getting at is sort of in that realm, right? So It's just, uh, just thinking on the surface, you know, uh, sure. because our information is out there. You know. but, but the point is, we're better off with it than without, right? Because certainly now, there's no, uh, <laughs> uh, no prohibition against that sort of thing. And, and what you're proposing is, well, maybe they could wiggle around, da da da, da right? But. <laughs> Any other questions from the committee? Thank you, sir. We Thank really you. appreciate your testimony. And now looking the prime sponsor, try to hold it off as long as possible. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the record. I'm Neil Berg, representing Hillsborough District 2, the towns of Deering and Ware. And I appreciate the fact that you were accommodating uh, finance just completed in the fastest executive session it's ever had, uh, in part due to the impetus to my need to be here. Um, there are a couple of very important things that are going on in our lives over the past few decades. And one of them, uh, or among others, are the development of the internet, the cell phone, and all of the things that we now have, which have allowed, as we know from the recent Facebook case, um, the accumulation of vast amounts of information about us in private hands, not necessarily in government hands, although that too. Um, our Constitution, in Article 19, Part 1, provides protection against um, or in the area of police investigation. This is the Fourth Amendment of the Federal Constitution. Our Article 19 makes sure that if the state is going to get into a person's physical possessions, information, whatever it is, in criminal matters, that they must have a warrant or an exception to the warrant requirement. Uh, and that's the kind of protection the founders said that we needed based on their experience with the British. CACR 16 um, goes beyond that. It deals with government, not the private sector, this is government, and talks about non-criminal information and says basically that we have an expectation of privacy with respect to that information should government wish to obtain it. Now please understand this does not in any way prevent the government from entertaining it from obtaining it, just as the Fourth Amendment does not prevent the government from searching your home or your possessions. What it does is to require the government to prove when it wants to get a warrant, for example, to get this information, or simply to pass a law to access this information, that there is a um, significant government interest in collecting the information that outweighs the now constitutionally right to have this information protected. So what we're doing is not barring government, but requiring government to meet a higher standard than it currently must in order to protect this information. 
Um, basically, the courts already do a balancing act in, when it comes to deciding all sorts of um, cases, and this simply requires it to do that with respect to information privacy. Um, please note that this is information. This includes all sorts of information about this, and the question is, should government have access to create a database, for example, of all of its citizens' um, information, where we were born, what we do, medical records, I heard that discussed as I was coming in, or should it not? And the answer is, we don't know. Is there a case that can be made that the value of that information is so important to protect public safety or public health or whatever it is that um, the court feels that the privacy interests of the individuals in their information should be sacrificed to the greater public good? Um, so in, in no way is this, bill, is this amendment going to cripple government's ability to, um, to function. Please also note that this only applies to government conduct related to individuals. It doesn't apply to commercial conduct, unless obviously the government hires a commercial outfit to uh, act in its stead. So this would have no impact, for example, on the Facebook brouhaha that we're hearing about. That's not related to this, at least as far as we know now. There's no government involved in that. Um, CACR 16 is a... I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time to me? that this doesn't apply to commercial activities. It applies to individuals' activities. So this wouldn't apply to Facebook, because Facebook isn't a government. Now, it would apply to, the, to Facebook if the government were trying to access Facebook information about a particular senator, for example. Then this would apply. Um, CACR 16 is a necessary step to take back an individual's privacy in his or her personal or private information in response to the growing prevalence and capacity of technology used by government. And I think this is um, very much in keeping with the New Hampshire tradition of um, placing the, the individual in charge of government rather than government in charge of the individual. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Four or five for the questions. Um, yes, thank you very much, Representative Kurt, and thank you for being here. Um, we heard testimony previously that such words as natural, essential, and inherent are vague and unenforceable. And would you be able to address that criticism? Um, yes, they were copied from various other sections of the Constitution. Whatever they mean in those other sections, they mean here. Thank you so much. <laughs> and one of the things that I think is, is clear about this is it's very simple. And it states a, a, a very basic premise. And I think your questions really go to, well, what does this really mean? And like so many of the other basic constitutional principles, it will evolve over the decades and centuries. But it's a necessary statement of a value that we hold that information owned by an, or about an individual is really not available to government without a sufficient reason that justifies it. So, follow up question? The other um, criticism that's been raised is that by putting this into statute, that it could be perceived going forward in legal cases that it protects a woman's right to choose. The only thing this would protect is uh, medical records, which is information about that person. It has nothing to do with Roe versus Wade or abortion or anything like that. Uh, that wouldn't be, uh, as I can, as I can intend, certainly not intended, and I, I don't understand it, to have anything to do with, except to say that if the government wants a, a woman's medical records, it's got to show that there's an exceptional interest in public health to get that. And if it can make that showing, then those records will be available. Follow up. Um, we heard that uh, part of the decision in Roe versus Wade was based on the right to privacy. I think that's where that comment or concern came from. I don't think Roe versus Wade was based on informational privacy. 
uh, I thought, Ro and I'm not the expert on Roe versus Wade, I thought Roe versus Wade uh, was more about um, the privacy relationship between perhaps a woman and her doctor, but not on information. I don't think information was the issue there. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Would, would any, uh, anything in this uh, legislation have any impediment to the PDMP discussions that we've been having in fiscal? Perhaps, but I think if somebody, let's assume this amendment were in effect, we put in the PDMP and somebody challenged it on the grounds that it violated uh, this constitutional right. I think the case could, the state could make a very strong case that for public safety and public health reasons, this information was absolutely essential to deal with the opioid crisis. So again, while I think it would be, the amendment would apply, I think the case, in my view, the case, the state has a very strong case for doing this. I happen personally to oppose the PDMP for privacy reasons, but even with this amendment, I think the case, the state has a very strong case to do it. For the public interest, could you uh, define what PDM means? Oh, uh, the prescription, uh, prescription data monitoring program. This is the one, this is the program that we set up where um, all prescriptions uh, for opioids by name of person and doctor prescribing go into a database and physicians are required when they make future prescribing decisions to look at this database and to see do we have a serial prescribing problem here. Uh, people can look at the database to see if there's a problem with the doctor. Is Dr. Jones over prescribing? Uh, the purpose is to give us information to prevent overprescriptions which lead to um, addiction and to deal with doctors who are involved in this and also to find out if there, are, if there are patients who are abusing the system. Again, we're trying to save lives here and this is one mechanism to do it. Any further questions? I'm, I'm sorry for the acronym, but uh, no. Senator Daniels is... He did. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, it's, it's important. I think we take for granted when all these things come, are put out there and we have people in the audience that are like, what is that? So, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for your testimony. Any further thank questions? Uh, seeing none. I have two more speakers and uh, we're going to hear from the Women's Defense League, Liz, and then we'll hear from Eugene. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Liz Tenterelli. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of New Hampshire, not the Women's Defense League. Did I say Defense League? You, you yeah. did. So I am correcting that for the record. It is the League of Women Voters of New Hampshire. And I did not sign in. in that's right. <laughs> I did not sign in in support or opposition. Rather, I'm speaking um, as representing our nonpartisan organization that feels it's very important for us to help the public understand constitutional amendments, should this make it to the ballot. So I'm pretending to be far more naive than I really am. I spend a lot of time here observing hearings. But for the average voter, when this appears on the ballot, it says, I've got a right to leave, live free of governmental intrusion. They can't tell me to register my dog, to license my dog, to register my car, to send my children to school. I fear there will be a problem. And I know that on the ballot, we have to go with language. I have heard Representative Kirk say this applies to information only. That is not in the phrasing here. It's not going to be obvious to the voters that that's what it means. So when Senator Bradley talked about unintended consequences, um, there could be huge ones in the part of in the minds of the voting public. So I would just encourage this committee and the bill sponsor and the sponsors of the CACR to figure <coughs> out how to make this clear to the voting public of what it includes and what it does not. 
I think we have the envelope to require to mention that we could define just through uh, the uh, uh, floor of speech as to the intent of this. So that is the permanent journalist for clarification. Who has the ultimate authority as to what is on the ballot? And uh, how that would be defined is that the issue that we need to address. I, I, I agree. In, in the last time we had a constitutional amendment, the League did try to provide information on both sides. We got blurbs, shall we say, from both sides and tried to publish that. Many people, however, came to the polls and we had League members stationed at the polls trying to answer voters' questions on their way in of what does this really mean. So it is an issue and thank you for recognizing that. Senator Fuller, part of the question? No. Okay. So that was yes and then no. <laughs> so did, did I hear you correctly to say that you did not feel that uh, this would be interpreted to apply to just information? Exactly. If, if, I, if I'm reading it here and it does, you know, I'm the naive voter, I have no idea it means information. So, so when we, we look at the, the question that would be put on us, It's the, the wording in lines three and four of the bill is apparently the wording that would be on the ballot. Whether there would be additional wording is unclear at this point, but that's what would be on there, and it says nothing about, I'm sorry, it says information there, doesn't it? Um, it, it does, it, I guess that's what I was going to point out that it does say government intrusion in private or personal information. Okay, and I was looking at the, the cover sheet to the bill where the word information is not there. So that's why I'm, I'm being cautious here. Okay. Oh, no, I just want to point out that. It is, it is in, in those lines. Would you include the word information in this whole um, just with that notation, are you comfortable that with that reference to information that um, the interpretation of this can be made clear? Um, I'm not sure. I, again, I, I wonder whether people will think that means I don't have to participate in the census in 2020. What kind of information for what uses? Uh, and, and I realize we're talking about the Constitution and things are not spelled out that way. I just fear there's going to be confusion on the part of the voters. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. Does anybody else want to speak on this? And we will hear from our final speaker, Jeannie Bristol. Good job. <laughs> you did say that right, huh? As long as I know what you're saying, you said it right. I'm going to, there's two pieces of paper here. One is my testimony, uh, and one is from law professor Buzzer, who helps with this CACR, but unfortunately can't be here today. So I'm going to provide testimony on my behalf and on his. I want to echo everything that Representative Kirk said about the bill, and we'll just clarify perhaps a couple of points. Uh, I want to start with the interesting notion, when I moved to New Hampshire, I think one of the first things that becomes very clear is how much Granite Staters care about privacy. And to me, it was interesting to learn that the word doesn't actually show up in our Constitution. To me, if New Hampshire would have anything in its Bill of Rights, it would be a right to privacy, given kind of our libertarian spirit, and yet we don't. Um, and perhaps that's because for the last several decades, we've had a patchwork of statutory protections regarding privacy. And that was sufficient until today's modern digital age. We now have Facebook, we have 23andMe, we have Ancestry.com. Our information is far more accessible and prevalent than it's ever been before. Um, and increasingly, the, the patchwork of statutory protections that we have are just not sufficient. Uh, I do want to note that CACR 16 is actually pretty limited. It does not prohibit any and all access to personal and private information. As Representative Kirk said, instead it would effectively change the balancing that a court already does when deciding whether government interest in gaining access to information outweighs the nature and degree of intrusion on an individual's privacy interest. 
So specifically, it would require the government to now show a compelling state interest in obtaining access to personal and private information before a court would order such access. Sometimes the state will be able to meet that burden, particularly in instances of public safety. Um, access to personal and private information for which the government has probable cause to believe will help solve a crime will still be accessible by a search warrant. By contrast, random gathering of personal and private information by the government as part of a fishing expedition, or just because nothing stops the government from doing so, will be prohibited by virtue of the balancing test described. It's also important to know, as Representative Kirk said, that, six, that CACR 16 only applies to government conduct related to individuals. The one slight caveat to that is it would apply to commercial conduct done on behalf of the government. So there was some question about kind of could the government ask companies to volunteer information and I think there would be a question there of if companies are acting on behalf of the government it could get caught by this um, and rightfully so. Um, so on that, um, part one of the New Hampshire uh, Constitution as we all know it only regulates interactions between the government and the individual. It's not designed to manage relationships or uh, exchanges between private individuals or entities. Um, so CACR 16 is absolutely needed to respond to the technological age that we now live in, um, but it is also limited to respond to people's uh, concerns about law enforcement, about public safety, uh, and we think it strikes the right balance between those two things. Um, with that said, I'm happy to answer questions. I'll be down one, but uh, you mentioned probable cause. Is that the standard to uh, generate a, a warrant? Uh, this, yeah, the same standards for search warrant that exists now would happen under this. It just this would now get factored into the court's balancing test. Any questions? Once, twice. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, put it out there. Nobody else wants to speak on this. We're going to close the hearing at CACR 16.